Hey there everyone, this is Samuel Johnson and welcome back to the Spider-Verse Retrospectives. Now, on Thursday, we wrapped up our look at the Edge of Spider-Verse miniseries. So, with that series out of the way, we're going to be moving on to the next trade in our collection. And as you can probably tell by the binding right there, well, we're going to be taking a look at the Spider-Verse trade. And as you can see, this is a pretty thick book. As the th And the reason for that is, well... Not only does this book contain the core Spider-Verse storyline, but it also has all of the tie-ins and, well, all the lead-in material. Sans Edge of Spider-Verse, though, that is considered part of the lead-in to it, so. As such, because of that, and as I mentioned back in the prologue, I'm going to be looking at every this book from front to back. And while the front of the book does have, like, a chronology that states what order certain stories happen or which issues come before what... For this, for this retrospective, I'm just going to be looking at it front to back, like I mentioned before. So that, include, that of course, means the lead-ins first, main storyline, then tie-ins. Which I know I mentioned before, but just want to repeat so no one's confused. About, so nobody is confused or whatnot. So there you go. But with that out of the way, there is one question to be raised. How will we be starting this? Well, for that, we're going to be taking a look at a backup story from an issue uh, from a comic that was printed for Free Comic Book Day in 2014. Specifically, the Guardians of the Galaxy comic. Yeah, I know. Why is a Guardians comic featured in a Spider-Man retrospective? But here, but the thing is, like I said, there was a backup story in the book, and that backup story actually tied directly into Spider-Verse, as it did act as a lead into it, as it featured a version of Spidey that was that well, kind of sort of took part in the event, and also kind of sort of showcased some more of the threat of the Inheritors. Which Spidey is that? Well. Before we actually get to talking about the story, let me talk about an alternate universe that, honestly, I am very fond of. Specifically, the 1602 universe. Now, if you can't tell by the nickname for this continuity, the 1602 universe is supposed to be an alternate Marvel universe set in the early 1600s. And in this Marvel universe, pretty much the big gimmick is that many famous Marvel characters that we all know today, like Doctor Strange, Daredevil, Nick Fury, and so on, all essentially made their first debut in the early 1600s. Now, of course, because they appeared at so early in the timeline, they actually did, they have to deal with different issues altogether, as part of the plot for the main storyline was dealing with Queen was the death of Queen, Queen Elizabeth I, because they transitioned to King James, some big political plots and so forth, as well as basing even greater persecution for those with superpowers, because back in that day, genetic, mani genetic manipulation and superpowers were considered, well, devils were considered evil. So, yeah, that kind of was the way it... So, it was pretty much... That's not... The, that's, that's some parts in the story, but I do recommend looking up the 1602 act series as a whole because, honestly, it is hands down one of my favorite comics, and ironically, I actually got wanted to find it. I finally gave, got, gave it a chance to read after I read this initial story. And it is just a damn good time. It's got great artwork, got a great story, really interesting reinterpretations of characters from the Marvel Universe. It's just really damn great. But, of course, one of the characters featured in that book was, of course, this own this world's version of Spider-Man. Or, more specifically, this world's version of Peter Parker, or as he's called here, Peter Parker. In the main story, he in the, in the main 1602 storyline, he acted as the apprentice to Sir Nicholas Fury of the Queen's Secret Service, but over time, when Nick Fury was branded a traitor, he wanted to, Peter was sent to act as kind of his assassin, as well, alongside this world's version of Bruce Banner, named David, and well, while he couldn't do it, the, story, the actual story wound up ending with Peter getting bitten by a radioactive spider. And if you want to know why a radioactive spider exists in the early 1600s, again, read the book, it's kind of explained there. But put simply, in the sequel series that followed, you saw that the spider bite did give Peter abilities very similar to that of his Earth-616 counterpart. Strength, proportionate strength, speed, agility, clinging to walls, and even his spider sense, and, and, and later on, the ability to shoot webs out of his wrist. As such, using these abilities, Peter wound up taking on the identity of the Spider, a costumed adventurer that helped where he could and, and fought such grievous criminals as Norman Osborn, Baron Octavius, and even the King's Pin. But, basically, it, I'm not going to go into his whole life story, as it is kind of getting into a bit more spoilery territory, but put simply, in his travel, but 
I will highlight this one thing because it is important, as in Peter's travels as the spider, he eventually crossed paths with the 1602 version of Mary Jane, or as she's called here, Marion Jane, of the troupe Watson, as in this reality, her family was a troupe of actors, and after Peter and, and, and Mary and Marion became a couple, he wound up traveling with them on the road as well, which is actually where this story picks up, as it op as the story actually opens in the Globe Theatre in London, and we see that Peter, ha Peter is doing a spider stick as part of the show as for as for uh, for a large crowd he's just doing all the things you would expect him to do shooting web clean the walls do pretty much showing the great agility etc and while people are freaked out because well this is a guy with powers he's must be he must be like witch breed or something because that's the name they give to these people they they pretty much the troop played off as just a, a gag a, a, a trick of the light so on and so forth but which is how they're able to keep it going but either way but regardless of the suspension of disbelief the audience is still wowed by peter and his antics and to try and to try and sweeten the deal as part of the show the troop watson has this little thing has a bet going that 10, ten shillings to the man who can take spider-man down a fight and well several men do take it up take peter do take them up on that offer and well peter wipes the floor with all of them just pretty much pretty much just showcasing that this is clearly one-sided but as such, after he takes out a few guys, he 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 boasts the crowd, "Come on, isn't there anyone who can take me on?" And sure enough, someone in the crowd does say they can. As they, but before he goes on stage, he says, "But you can keep your money. I'm after something even I'm after something even greater, dinner." And in the next page, we soon see who the challenger is. It's Morlin. And the instant he sets foot on stage, Peter's spider sense starts blaring. Of course, Peter tries brushing it off and says, "Okay, fine. But you'll have to work for your dinner." Dinner, Mr. And when Morland introduces himself, he tells him you don't make promises you can't keep, Peter. Which does cause, which causes Peter to be on edge, because, well, how does Morland know his name? But but when he tries asking him, Morland just talks, continues talking about how he's always hungry, so very hungry. And at this point, re Peter realizes that this guy is probably someone he doesn't want to get, he realizes that Morland is is a bigger threat than he realizes. As such, he tells Marion and her family to get out of there because he knows that whatever that whatever's going to happen next, it's probably going to cause a lot of collateral damage. But Peter does think that he can still be a match for him as he immediately throws a punch at Morland's face and breaks his hand. As such, in response to this, Morland talks about how he, that's such a taste, but he wants more. And then he just backhands Peter into a pillar, completely shattering it and causing the gathered crowd to run for it. And in the, mean, in the meantime, Morlin is grabbing a, a, this large chunk of the pillar, and while Marion is sadly watching on, Peter, well, he realizes he's screwed. As he begins contemplating his life, how he traveled to the colonies, how he found love, had such adventures, and how he thinks that this is how, how he doesn't want his story to end here. And then Morlin stabs him right in the back with the, with the pillar. As such, with Peter now dying on the floor, Morlin holds him down and then proceeds to suck out his life horse, proclaiming that everything Peter was, is, and ever will be is now his. And after, and once he sucks out his life force, he gets up, talks about how that's not enough, how he, the, how the hunt continues, and that, it, it, and that soon, very soon, as it was foretold, all spiders will die before he, before a portal opens and teleports him away leaving Peter's body lying there in the Globe Theater, so. Yeah, that's the whole story. And yeah, it's a short one, but like I said, this is a backup story in the in a in a free comic book day issue. But put simply, but it, yeah, pretty much the whole story just exists to build hype, so to speak. And honestly, I think it can kind of showcase that because in one brief little story, they pretty much just set up the whole situation as we see as the story opens with an alternate Spidey just doing his own thing, pleasing crowds and being entertaining, before the bit before one of the bad bad guys shows up and pretty much just wipes the floor with him, showcasing that in a fair fight, he stood. Peter did not stand a chance. Like I said, he threw a punch at Morlin and broke his hand, which is very hard to do when you had super strength. And then Morlin just backhanded him into a pillar, and the and the and the smack was so bad that he could barely get back up. And but and even then, even with his enhanced agility and reflexes, Morlin was able to go in for the kill and stab him through the back. So it sets up right away just how much of a big threat the that Morlin is, and that well, this is not going to be the last because as we saw in Edge of Spider Verse. He is still hunting more Spideys. We've we saw it with Aaron Aikman, we saw it with Patton Parnell, and now we see it with Peter Parker. 
as now as now we know that he at least three spideys are dead by his hand and that he's gonna keep going and he makes it clear that he ain't stopping until every spidey across the multiverse is gone so yeah i think that's a good way of building hype as it starts off with one spot as we see a spidey dying and that more on the way. So, I will admit, I think that's a good way of, tr of trying to grab your readers. Make them realize, who's this guy? Because even if you are not familiar with Moreland, which, like I said, prior to reading the story, I didn't know who he was. Pretty much, more. I feel like this is a good way of introducing him. As we see this guy who, immediately upon entering the scene, triggers Peter's spider sense. He re and when Peter tries talk, and when Peter tries asking him what his deal is, he just talks about how he's so very hungry, and that combined with him knowing Peter's name and his spider sense tingling makes him realize, okay, this guy's a, this guy might be a problem. So it works to the advantage of the story because it does a good way of building hype, and when it ends with Peter dying, it does make you wonder how things will proceed from here. Like, we know that there are more Spideys out there and that these people and that Moreland and his ilk are most likely legitimate threats if they can take down one Spider-Man with just a one-on-one -on -one fight. So, at the very least, I do think it works as a way of building hype. But with that being said, a major drawback of this is that it really does feel dark and depressing, which I guess, does, which I think can work in, in the right amount. In this regard, it does showcase that Molin is a large threat that does need, that needs to be stopped, and based on what you saw here, you can see why it would constitute multiple Spider-Men from across the multiverse having to work together to stop him. But with that being said, this ultimately kind of addresses one of the drawbacks of the original Spider-Verse story, and one that, sadly, I do kind of have with it. Despite how I love the book, I do. But one of the things, but one of the defining aspects of the Spider-Verse story is that the Inheritors are hunting Spider-Man. And the thing is, it's not like we have, like, near miss, n misses or have the spot, or have some Spideys get, stay, or get warned before the Inheritors arrive and then they take part in the fight. No, there are casualties in the story, which... I know you can say, well, we saw casualties before with Edge of Spider-Verse 3 and 4, but the thing is, with those casualties, those were Spideys created specifically for the event. Those were new guys who, cre who for all I know, were created just to die. This Spider-Man, however, this is the, based on, on how we've read so far, this is the first Spider-Man who has been pre-established in another book the 1602 books and the thing is he had a full story i when i after i read this book i did when i decided to go back and read the 1602 books i was drawn in because peter's story i found to be very interesting he it's a, basically it was a story of a young man coming into his own and having to learn the whole the whole mantra of power and responsibility based on his experiences, not just because of a single tragedy with Uncle Ben. And so when he developed his spider identity and everything that went with it, it was essentially like a man coming into his own. And like he said when he was dying, he had such grand adventures and he did such grand things. He fought monsters, villains, he saw a gateway into time and space, he saw he saw a man get transmuted into a goblin, he saw a half-octopus guy. This Peter had a very adventurous life and he did so many grand things. And now it all just comes to an end at the hand of this random guy that he never met before. No buildup, no hot, no warning. He just comes in, challenges Peter to a fight, and then kills him. In that regard, I feel like it's depressing, especially since there are there, especially if you're a fan of this particular version of Spider-Man. Imagine if you had read the 1602 books prior to reading this story, and then when you get to this story in the back of the book, you're like, "Oh my God, they're, they bring they bring him back. What are they gonna do with him?" Only to find that they that he was that this version of Spidey was only brought back just so they could kill him off. It's it feels it feels tacky in that regard, which I get it. I understand. They do need to build the stakes. They need to establish why the inheritors need to be stopped and that in a fair fight and that why all these spideys have to be brought together because in a one-on-one -on -one fight they could the inheritors can whoop the spideys all asses so i understand that but at the same time it feels sucky that you take a pre-established character and who's had multiple stories about them and then just off them just in a very in a very dark and in a very dark way because like I said it's clear that that Peter was not gonna win that fight 
Moreland outweigh Moreland outclassed him in many regards, and just from and ultimately, essentially, it was a curb stomp. Peter Bear, Peter only got one shot in, and it didn't do anything. If anything, it just hurt him more than it hurt Moreland. So, at the end of the day, while I do think the story is good for building hype to Spider Verse, at the end of the day, I think that's really all it's best for. It's got good artwork, and it is pretty and. It did make me, and I will admit, the story did make me curious enough to check out the 1602 books, which I do recommend looking up. The first story is honestly the best, while the sequel series is kind of varying quality, in my opinion. But at the very least, it did get me curious about the 1602 books enough to read them, so I guess that works in its own regard. But in the context of the story, it really does feel, well, the context of the story, well, it does well at what it intended to do. Excuse me a sec. Sorry about that. Anyway, like I was saying... While the story does well in essentially establishing the threat and showcasing the why of the spider why Spider Verse happened, at the same time it does feel kind of tacky that we had that we had to lose a Spidey to do it. And spoiler warning: this is not going to be the first pre-established Spider-Man that bites the dust in this book. There's going to be even one that I'm de 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 that really got on my nerves when I saw it, which I'll talk about when it happens, but. Overall, story's not bad. Story's not bad. Did what it was supposed to, but it does have little things that could easily get under any comic reader's skin, especially if they are familiar with this continuity and this Spidey. So, yeah, that's really all I have to say. A short, a shorter video today, but it's a shorter story, so what can you do? So, I hope you did enjoy it regardless, and next time we meet, we're going to be looking at some more lead-in material for Spider-Verse, and I will finally get the chance to talk about, hands down, one of my favorite variants of Spider-Man, the Superior Spider-Man. If you want to know why he's one of my favorite, well, tune in on Tuesday to see it. But till then, I hope you have a good day. I'm Samuel Johnson, and I'll see you, and I'll see you next time. Take care.